Cheers. On the beach. On the beach. We're here only, with Perry Sprague. Only in Oregon. Look at this. This is a fall day. Mm -hmm. It's gorgeous. We're in sunny. October. And we're here. So, Terry, who are you? What do people got to know? You have an interesting story that I want people to hear. Well, where I'm at right now is the most important thing is I'm a dad, I'm a husband, um, part of the community, supporting the community, and then I've been fortunate enough to build a great real estate business. So what have you built in real estate? Because you've built something amazing that everybody wishes they could build. And so what, what have you built? So it's funny, you. Um, I, I feel unemployed every day, so I'm always hungry. And I think that comes from a background of uh, being self-made. And real estate is not a business that annuitizes itself. Literally, you can put together a deal tomorrow, and the next thing you know, you're unemployed. You're looking for the next house to sell, the next buyer to represent. And so there's that constant hunger and concern about positioning myself and having enough inventory. And I'm very strategic about building that inventory so that I can manage myself through different economies. And you do this solo. You don't, you, you don't have a team. You have a brokerage, but it's not a team where their numbers count for your numbers. And how, how does one do what you do solo? Because for the people who are watching who don't know, I mean, what numbers do you do solo? So you uh, last year was a tough year. I did about 100 million in sales. The year before, about 150 million in sales. So that's about 30, 40 deals between three to $15 million deals. And, you, and all solo, you have one assistant, you have- So actually I'm not solo. I have to give a lot of credit to the people around me. So my business model is people, process, surprise, and delight. Now I get a lot of the credit for it, but imagine putting on a Broadway play, all right? So yes, there's that person that gets to be the star and gets up on stage and gets all the accolades, but there are the people that set up the stage, write the script, um, you know, build out the, uh, you know, all the lighting on the stage, everything. And so there are two incredible people that work with me, Paris Hollenbaugh, Lisa Neef, that are behind the scenes and in front of the scenes when it comes to contractual work, when it comes to part of that fiduciary work. I've got an incredible principal broker in Marty Wells. Kendra Ratcliffe is somebody that is at our company that helps me get all the global coverage that I get. Um, and then there's third party people, people like yourself that do video. Uh, I've been working with August Gilgis, uh, Kyle, an incredible uh, drone pilot, uh, Steve Hanning. Um, there's a huge array of different people, designers that help me set up the houses, writers. Uh, there's actually a large amount of people around me when I call people process that understand my process and the end of that process is surprise and delight, which is I want the clients to remember us and remember the experience so that when someone says, hey, who'd you use for a real estate broker? They have a surprising and delightful story about something we did. So while I get the credit, there's a ton of people behind me, Evan. And so coordinating all that, you know, doing 150 million in sales, how do you deal with the pressure? Because a lot of people, you know, they don't have the stress tolerance. And so how do you have that stress tolerance? Where do you find that motivation to wake up every day and just do what you do? So um, I think being self-employed or, you know, when you're a broker, you own your own business. And people see the positive optics of what I perform but I'm human. I, I, you know, I wake up feeling in desperation or I wake up feeling, uh, you know, upside down sometimes, but very quickly in the morning, I turn myself around, uh, head to my first appointment. And, um, you know, clients all often say, Terry, you're always so mellow. And, um, you know, the reality of it is there isn't a circumstance that comes up. And I think it, it's going through so many life experiences that just gives you, um, a sense of balance that uh, I, I really don't get stressed out. Right. I do, I do have stress, but in most of the time I'm, I'm pretty mellow. So it's just one foot in front of the other until you're there? It is, and it's just literally, um, 
you know, I'm not that complicated. I, I, I answer the phone and I write out a list of to-dos every day. And by the end of the day, I try to strike out all of my to-dos. I try to return all my phone calls and I try to answer all my emails. Right. So what I think it comes down to is do the things that you're supposed to do and do the things that you say you're going to do. People, you know, it's funny. Um, sometimes I just feel like I'm getting away with an enjoyable success. And a lot of times clients say to me, Terry, you know what's different about you? You answer your phone. Right. And, uh, you know, we're in this era right now of people are thinking they need to have boundaries and, uh, you know, there's this personal space they need. I, I actually do well in chaos and celebrate chaos. Maybe it's the angle of looking at things. Instead of looking at chaos as stress, think of the chaos at Disneyland. Think of the chaos as a, at, at an airport. Think of the chaos in the streets of New York City. Everything moves and you get from one spot to the other. Um, you know, Disneyland is fun, but you know, there's not a left and a right lane, but you move from ride to ride and it's chaos. So I think it's embracing chaos. And so you just get there and it's a mindset thing, right? It's how you choose to look at things as opposed to, you know, something bad happens and just throwing your arms up and saying, you know, oh, well, what am I going to do? This is horrible. It's, it's, you know, this is part of the chaos. This is, you know, there's somebody slow walking in front of you at Disneyland. You find a new path around. You well, get celebrate the chaos. How lucky are you to have chaos and right. activity in your life? It means you're doing something and, right. Uh, you know, I work with a lot of professional athletes and, um, while I uh, was never an outstanding athlete myself, but I enjoyed sports, I, I kind of look at life like a sporting event that, you know, there's that rather than looking at a situation where, you know, you're 25 points behind and it's the fourth quarter and you give up and, and you feel rejected. Instead, it's like, how can I strategize and move through this moment? And then once you do succeed and you get that W, that win, that just builds up a, an extra level um, of ability and, and structure in yourself that, you know, you've, you're more calloused and you, and you know anytime adversity comes, it's kind of actually exciting. Right. And so, you know, navigating through that chaos, I would imagine you've experienced a ton of failures, right? And failures for some people is like, that's it, that's over. But what do you do when you face failure? I have failures every single day, okay? Um, you know, sure enough, there's two or three phone calls where you're spinning 20 plates at a time. And, uh, you know, there's, there's sometimes weeks that I, I feel like someone's just taking a baseball bat to my plates. Um, the way you manage it is uh, you, you look at the opportunity and you, you recognize that that is just part of the process. You know, that's, that's mother nature. Uh, you know, life has storms. Life has storms. And so, you know, you said you've had a lot of experiences, and I know you have one hell of a story. So where did you start out? Because I think a lot of people see someone in your position as somebody who was maybe lucky early on or uh, maybe had opportunities that others don't. So just where? tell us your story from, like, the beginning. So grew up a uh, humble background, six kids in a 1,500-square-foot house in North Portland, and... Um, a very diverse community that had its ups and downs. Uh, I was really never a great scholar. I had a blast. I have no regrets of where I grew up. My mother and father did a wonderful job uh, raising six kids. I was kind of the one kid in the family that academically I wasn't very proficient. And back then, learning, difference, learning differences really weren't diagnosed. And um, I have... Uh, an amazing brain for conceptualizing ideas and seeing pathways forward. But when it comes to reading and writing, uh, you know, sometimes it feels like kryptonite. So I can write a business plan in seconds, and uh, which I do for every house that I list. But when it comes to, I, I, I've always, back in my stock to trading days, I've always surrounded myself by people that support me and then I do what I do, which is I communicate to people successfully. Um, I unfortunately, at about 15 years old, I was going to school one day and I rarely went to school. 
at Roosevelt High School and the principal suspended me. I came home to my dad and said, you know, I think I'm going to quit school. And my dad said, okay, you can quit school, but you've got to move out. And so what was that? At 15 years old, I mean, most kids nowadays, I mean, there's people living in their parents' house till they're 30, and at 15 years old, you know, you got to go out, live on your own. I would imagine you've, you've learned a lot. I think we grew up early in our neighborhood. We did a lot of things early. <laughs> right. And um, when my dad said, you got to move out, I, I didn't think twice about it. And at the time, I had uh, um, two sisters that were going to University of Oregon. And so... I hitchhiked down to University of Oregon, and I think my mom and dad thought I was running away basically for the weekend, and I went to church with one of my sisters, and I met a guy, Kevin Teller, who owned a landscaping company, and he said he'd give me a job for two days. I was tiny. You can see I'm not a big guy right now, and I remember the first time taking a big commercial wheelbarrow uh, with a bunch of sod, and it just took me for a run, but after two days, he said, look, I'm going to give you a job. I said, well, I need a place to live. And he was a young guy. He was only 26 years old. He rented me his garage. So um, I was in heaven. I had a, a waterbed. My only source of heat was that waterbed. And my furniture was some old uh, gas cans and lawnmowers. But he and I would get up at 5 in the morning every day and go to work. And I have to tell you, um, he became a great role model. And he had very high expectations. His, uh, it was Teller landscaping company which stood for TLC and I think that was the beginning of understanding the perfection of if you're gonna do something do it the best do it right right and so I've heard you say this before you say that you know nobody's successful on their own at some point in their life somebody came along and gave them a chance and was that your chance right there it was one you know obviously my parents did a great, we were communicators in our house. <laughs> and uh, Kevin was kind of the breakthrough, I think, of still today, when I think about the details of how we completed jobs every day, we would back up the trucks before the clients came home. If it was dark, we would turn the lights on. We would wash down the walkways. Every edge of the landscaping was perfect. It was that you know, I remember getting up and first time I ever went to breakfast with him, I was um, ordering with the menu, with my head in the menu. And Kevin told me, look, Terry, look at the waitress, look at her eyes and speak to her as a human being and respect her. And, you know, I think that that was, you know, the standards of not just doing things right, but also having character and treating other human beings with respect. And I think there's a benefit of starting at the, you know, the beginning, sweeping, uh, landscaping, construction. And by the time I was 16, I was a foreman. And so that sounds a lot like habits, right? You, you uh, turn the lights on if it's dark, you wash off the pathway. That sounds a lot, uh, you know, uh, being a good person, but it also kind of falls into habits of somebody who, you know, you wake up in the morning and you make your bed in the morning. Right. So right. I'm a strong believer in habits make you who you are. So how do you view habits of, you know, you know, we don't have to turn the lights on when they come home, but it's a good habit to get into because it, you know, it takes you to the next level and then and people see those habits. So how do you view habits? You know, I think uh, it's about being intuitive, seeing what needs to be done, whether it's in your job uh, description or not, and just doing it and then being intuitive to see opportunities. I used to carry a Wayne Gretzky card in my wallet till it practically dissolved when I lived in the Caribbean. And uh, you know, Wayne Gretzky said, while everyone focuses on where the puck is, I focus on where the puck is going to be. So like that simple idea of positioning yourself in life. And um, you know, I, I am a very caring person. I care about my clients. I care about the people around me. I care about the community. I care about, um, you know, I look myself in the mirror. I care about what I think of myself and what God thinks about myself. Um, I try to stay centered. I'm not perfect, but uh, it, it's amazing how many opportunities have come along because you share with other people what you want and doors open. Yeah, and so you, you, you've told me that 
uh, you lived in the Caribbean, and then you came back here, and then you started, where'd you start your real estate career? Windermere? So, in 2000, uh, you know, I'd done the stockbroker thing, um, went to work for Shears the Lehman Brothers, was Rookie of the Year after uh, being a clothing buyer. That was, I went to work for Myron Franks, went through their executive training program, worked for Mario's in Portland, um, got a job as a clothing buyer in Hawaii, ended up going back to University of Oregon, actually got a GED. I did not really graduate from high school until I was like 20, 21 years old. Perfect. And I got into University yeah. of Oregon with that GED. And the goal was, number one, I wanted to be a kid. I wanted to be around other kids. I wanted to do, I just been working all my life. And somebody in the HR department at Myron Franks actually said, Jerry, why don't you go be a kid? And so I, I grabbed a GED book and I went and sat down at University of Portland and, and studied at night and uh, took the test. Went down to University of Oregon Spent a year just taking communication courses, and then got recruited to a buying position in Hawaii, and I was buying high-end Italian men's clothing, going flying to Magic in Nansby, Beverly Hills, New York, buying clothing. It was a pretty cool life. Moved back to the mainland, um, ended up going to work for um, Shearson Lehman Hutton to date myself, you know, when that, that was a long time ago, Twin Towers. Flew back to New York, went through training, and then um, worked in Portland and Seattle, uh, spent a little time in LA during training down there, and then um, kind of had a burnout Jerry Maguire moment in 99, because I, I worked hard, flew hard, uh, and decided I'd move to the Caribbean. And so I moved to Antigua, and I became an artist and a sailor. And uh, the way I got into art was, up in Seattle, I don't know, do you remember Napster? You're probably too young for Napster. Yeah, it's like OG but Spotify. Legend, yeah, the OG. Music. Yeah, well, so Napster was a place you could download music for free yep. before Apple Music and uh, Spotify. Spotify. And, all that. and so one time I was downloading some music and I saw this thing called Photoshop and I downloaded that and the first digital camera was on my laptop. We didn't have real digital cameras. So I would go around with this digital camera and take imagery. At the time, I was living in Kirkland in Seattle. And I would take imagery of beautiful scenes. And then I played around with all the filters till it looked like a Monet. Then I tweaked the colors so it looked like a Peter Max or an Andy Warhol. And then I went to Kinko's and said, hey, I want you to blow this up on a five-foot canvas. I didn't know how to paint, but I took the digital image and I painted by numbers the whole digital image. And then I showed it to a gallery up in Seattle and they said, this is really cool art. Do you want to do a first Thursday? And I'm like, I'm an artist. And then I started taking sailing classes every day. I lived on Lake Washington and um, became a pretty good sailor, got an advanced ocean sailing certificate and decided to move to the Caribbean. I had some professional advice. Uh, at a time I went through that I decided to give up drinking completely because I was an excellent drinker. Uh, my biggest fans were Jimmy Buffett. You know, I was a fan of Jimmy Buffett and Hemingway and Hunter S. Thompson, but I was just wearing myself out. So I actually intervened on myself and um, went through some uh, professional advice moments. And like right now, I think I've been 25 years without a cocktail. Congratulations. And so- And the ironic thing is when I moved to the Caribbean, I found this 10 acre estate and um, went to the National Museum of, of Museum of Antigua uh, and worked with them. I said, hey, all the local artists, they sell their art on the streets. What if I created an art gallery for all the local artists? What if you got me a family that could barbecue local food and then we'll build a stage and we've got this view of Montserrat and we'll, we'll turn the house into an art gallery. We'll have live music in the backyard and that became Heavenly Hill. And so for like five years, I went sailing every day, fishing every day, painting every day, doing photography, and worked with a bunch of artists. To, and then I met my wife on the beach one day, Maureen, who you've met yeah, from that, New York. That's a lovely story. And so, you know, that makes me think like, just having the initiative to be like, I have this 10 acre state, I'm just gonna call the city and 
I don't know what I'm doing. I've never put this all together, but you know what? I'm going to do it anyways. How do you, how do you have that initiative to, to do so? I mean, the thought process be like a lot of people sit around and think like, oh, I have this idea. I want to do this, but they business never plans come step. to me really fast. So I can, if I've got a whiteboard, I can take the start and plan out the whole plan of the business very quickly. In fact, I'm involved in angel funding and um, other companies just because I'd be bored if, if I, my brain goes real fast. And so, uh, you know, real estate is one of those things where when we, I came back to visit my mom, basically we had just done a, Marina had just completed a cross Atlantic trip. We used to get to move these beautiful yachts. I'd get paid to sell across the Atlantic. And we came back to visit my mom and my mom was dying. And my, um, I said, I don't, I don't think she's gonna live. So I flew back to Antigua, closed down the businesses and I was trying to figure out what I would do for an occupation. I didn't want to go back to Wall Street and I bought a house. And during the process of buying the house, I was kind of like, what do these guys do? And back then, imagery, uh, you know, it was just coming out of the era of the RMLS book. I mean, I think they were just starting to syndicate uh, online. And, uh, and I thought, where's the beautiful imagery? Where's the Where's the, the science behind the marketing? Because I had a merchandising background and, and you know, when you're doing merchandising and the way you, you know, it, take Mario's for instance, you know, we used to have all the Izod shirts with the alligators facing out and all the suits in the perfect position, your mannequins with the perfect outfits. So you walk into a store and you see the display and I'm like, where's that in real estate? And where's the science of understanding this house and who's going to buy the house. So I sat down and wrote a business plan. Yeah. And so, you know, you talk a lot about, uh, how you were here then you were there, <laughs> then you were here, then you were there, then you're like, I want to go be a kid again. Then I'm going to go sail. So what do you think, what, what would you tell somebody who's younger, maybe even your younger self, who's stressed about where they'll be in life, where they'll end up, where, uh, you know, where they're going or somebody who thinks they're behind when they're so young, maybe in their early 20s, what would your advice be to them? I, you know, I think this is an amazing time right now because I do worry about the, this generation not really having the same work ethic and then relying on technology and information to just kind of try to find some uh, utopian way of living. I don't know, I'm old school. I think you go out and you work for people and you're the guy, that you're the woman who shows up first in the morning, leaves last at night, and you're intuitive enough that if you see something that needs to be done at work, wherever you work, that the management is always observing you as the person picking up that piece of paper off the floor, even though it's not your job. Doing, stepping in, being curious, thinking about the business that you work at, and, and actually saying, you know, I see a better way of doing this. I see a better way of delivering a service. I you know, going to the people that run the company and saying, look, I'm so curious. Um, I want to be an idea person. And you know what? Employers are just completely starved for looking for people that show up early, that, that have ideas. And, and quite frankly, it's not that easy to move, not that hard to move up in a company because once people observe you being that person that's always going out of your way, opportunities will open up. And then, you know, in today's world, I would get out a business journal and I would look for companies that, that I don't go to just work at a company. Don't go work at a coffee, unless you want to work at a coffee shop because you dream to make coffee and maybe that's a good thing to do for a while. And I think actually working at Starbucks or McDonald's is good training. But like there's, I'm fascinated by the different companies and technologies that are out there right now. Artificial intelligence, you know, go find out who are startup companies or Who's, who are market leaders in each industry and go to the people that run those companies, follow them on LinkedIn, do your research and go in and say, look, I will sweep the floors. I will show up for free. I, I want to be, mow your lawn. I, I want to be part of this company. Much like how I did with you. I mean, I, I just put myself in front of you enough times until you recognized a little bit of that. And I, you know, I think that's, that's what it's exactly of it. I mean, I observed you so I have a rule in my business. I, I want the real estate industry, I want all realtors to, to up their game. And, um, and then 
and I want people to have access to higher level, higher priced inventory. And I always say to people, look, you can take videos, you can market my properties. It, it benefits me. I mean, if you market my properties and you find a buyer, that's great for my, you know, I'm not concerned about my market share. And I would see you out in the marketplace shooting videos and doing content and you were always respectful and well presented. And then I'd look at the content, you created it and I liked it. And then I said, hey, you know, I already have certain people that do certain types of collateral for me, but there's a new kind of collateral I'd like to create. Maybe we could do some stuff together. And here we are. So it's all about positioning, where you are in life, where you want to be. And so, you know. Well, you obviously, to ask you a question, you obviously wanted to shoot high end real estate. Yeah. I mean, what drew you to that? You know, I wish I had an answer. Well, I don't know. It's, 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 I, it's just, it's, I've been drawn to it and, you know, I wasn't afraid to, you know, everybody's like, oh, that's, that's Terry Sprague. I'm like, I'm just going to call this guy. But see, I am the most approachable guy in the world. And um, it's, it's funny because I remember the first time I called you, you sat on the phone with me for like 10 minutes. Okay. And that was the first time I had experience. And this was everybody telling me like, that's the top guy. That's the top guy. And I, and I called you and you, you had a 10 minute phone conversation okay. with me some kid that you didn't know who just said hey can i come in and film one of your listings and then you had a 10 minute phone conversation with me and so you know then it was all about me just putting myself in front of people like you and just not being afraid to you know take that first step and just call and you know i i knew i've always known that like i want to do more like i don't want to just be an average person and so you know, going into the high-end luxury real estate market is is something that many strive for but fall short. And, you know, why? Why do they fall short? I mean, anybody can get to wherever they want. Just It just takes a little bit of, you know, go-getting. Well, and you never know. You know, I always, I have people that have worked with me a very long time. But at the same time, I've had some people that have come to work with me a couple of years. And I want their experience with me to help them if they give me, if you give me your time, I want you to look back someday and say, I learned from that guy and I'm going to learn from you. And no matter how long the relationship lasts, um, you know, because I think you have a lot of opportunities in the world. Yeah. And I think there's, I think what people don't realize is there's more of you Terry's out there than they realize. There's I think a ton. just because this guy's at the top, oh, he's not going to want to talk to me or, you know, he's he's way too good for me. You're too busy. I think there's more Terry's out there than people realize. And if you just give them a call or even say, hey, bro, I'll just I'll mow your lawn for free. Like, just, <laughs> just let me sweep the floors. You know, um, I think there's more of you out there than people realize. I think that we live in a day and age where, uh, you know, the social media, the news we get is all about plane crashes not landings so good information just doesn't grab people's attention and so I can't you know fortunately for myself um, you know I don't tend to listen to the noise very much but I notice a lot right now that um, it's got to, it's easy to become fearful depressed have a lack of hope in today's world because you're just being supercharged with negative information and I would say turn that noise off and the reality of it is we talk so much about how unfair life is and, and opportunities for, uh, you know, wh whoever you are, whatever you're born with, whatever your situation is, there are a lot of people out there that if you show up and you do a great job and you have great character and you let them know what your dreams are, there are tons of people that will open doors. Right. And you talk a lot about that, opening doors and... Uh, yeah, I think just it's just the negative energy needs to go away, and people are so afraid, like you said, and, and in an oppressed world. And, you know, what would you say to anybody who's, you know, feels like they're trying, but it feels like they're not there yet? Well, I would say, you know, then go out and work. And if that means starting at every, any level of any occupation, you know, and today right now, there's so much opportunity. I mean, the service industries, you know, everybody, if you look on Instagram, you want to be an influencer or, or something like that, but there are so many career opportunities. And I mean, 
you got ChatGPT. I mean, that's like, what a great resource to, to, to get out of writer's block. Go on to ChatGPT and describe yourself and describe your interests and say, what career should I be looking at? Identify those companies and go work there and go put in the time and don't expect to make a lot of money right away. Move up the ladder. I mean, I know of so many CEOs that started out at General Motors sweeping the floors in the warehouse and became CEOs of companies. It you can do time. that. That, Yeah, it takes time, you know, and you know, don't just wait around for an opportunity. Don't be, you know, somebody, I look at it this way, you could be a cat or a dog in life. All right, a cat sits around and waits for something better to come along. You put its food somewhere, it sleeps somewhere, it lays its, gets its fur all over the top of a couch somewhere. Not much changes for a cat. A dog, on the other hand, goes out, busts through the door anytime you accidentally leave it open, puts its head out the window, smells the fresh air when you're in a car, digs for the bone. Um, you know, go out and create opportunity. Don't wait for it to come along. And, and, and you know, don't rely on the internet and emails. Go knock on the door of the company you want to work at. Go find out who runs that company. Go straight to the source. Go straight to the source. Position yourself. Ask people. You know, there's the six degrees of separation, right? Go figure out the six degrees of separation. Go find out who knows somebody that knows somebody that knows somebody at the company you want to work at. Right. If you wait for opportunity, it will never come. And you know what? We're all about fairness these days, and, and uh, there's no utopia in life. There will always be competitive people, and if you're waiting around for the world to adjust and make it easier, I, I, I tell you, it's not going to happen. Um, you know, imagine if you were a runner, right? Mm -hmm. Imagine if we wanted to make race running more fair, the one-mile race more fair. And you'd say, you know, at the end of two laps, you get to take a break, have a Gatorade and a power bar, and then start running again. It's going to be an easier mile. There'll always be a guy or a girl. They'll show up and say, I don't need that break. I'm going to run, and I'm going to win. There's going to be competitive people no matter what. You cannot change the world and stop making people competitive. So, I don't know, you can choose to just live in mediocrity, but I think it's kind of fun to get outside of the box and be your best. Stay outside of your comfort zone, right? Yeah, why not? I mean, life is so short. So short, and yeah, comfortability. I think, yeah, people get comfortable and then, you know, they don't reach their, <coughs> their true potential. And I think everybody has it in them. It's just they gotta choose to bring it out. Well, I think it's okay, you know, run at your pace. Everyone's on their own time. And, right? and you know what? Sometimes I envy people that just have a regular career that's nine to five and they got the weekends off. I envy that. But personally for me, it's in my DNA, I would go crazy. You know, when I got into real estate and I looked at them, I'm like, what do they do? They take some pictures, they put in this thing called the RMLS and they put it out there and wait. And I'm like, okay, no, I've got to be proactive. I mean, I always, one of the questions that I always ask myself, um, Kendra Ratcliffe and I discussed this was, what would I do to put, you know, everybody talks about disruption. What would I do to put myself out of business? So knowing what I know about what I do in my real estate delivery, what, what would I do if I was interviewing against me? Right, so that's interesting. What would I do to put myself out of business? Kind of identifying your weaknesses, right? Which then leads you to become a market leader and come up with disruptive ideas. So in other words, you know, think of Kodak. They got disrupted by digital imagery. Right. Think of Hollywood Video and Blockbuster. They got disrupted by streaming video. But any of those companies, if they would have stopped for a second and said, what would put us out of business? We're, we're renting CDs. We're Hollywood Video. We're Blockbuster. We're renting CDs. What would put us out of business is if um, people could just stream from home and at the time the technology I remember when that technology was like no way right but then the iPhone came along and FaceTime came along and it was kind of like not too long before they figured out how to get enough bandwidth where now 
you can stream at home, you don't go to Hollywood Video, and that company's out of business. Imagine if that company would have stopped and thought about, wait, we have the email address and name and phone number of pretty much of every single person that rents a movie in the United States. Why don't we be a streaming company? But you know what, they thought, maybe they thought people are gonna still want to come to the store, mom and dad goes over to that section, the kids go to that section, they meet, they get some popcorn and some uh, licorice, and they thought that was a, um, a part of life that would live on, but it got disrupted. So what would you do to disrupt yourself and put yourself out of business? And in real estate right now, there's a ton of new things that are gonna happen that are gonna disrupt the industry. AI? Oh, artificial intelligence, the ability to process a, a transaction, differently you know the whole NAR thing right now with you know really having to understand and justify your value um, and I think the safest place to be is at the very top of the iceberg when it comes to delivering an experience for clients and delivering value and so that means that you know I have a financial background I have a merchandising background marketing background construction there's a lot of wisdom that I think when people are hiring me, they recognize they're not hiring a, a, a person that's gonna open doors, they're hiring an advisor. Right. And so how do you become an advisor? And is there a particular part of real estate that you can be an expert? Right, and it comes back to those small things too. Like you said, they come home at night, you turn on the lights, you back their trucks back in, yeah. you wash. Most people aren't gonna do that, but even you, who's at that tip, I mean, you would still turn off all the lights. Oh, no, still believe, me. Lights. believe me. Believe me. You, you would go above <laughs> and beyond. My expectations of myself and the people that work with me are so high. And, if and that's what drives them all. That's what's great. And they celebrate that. They like it. We celebrate the, um, you know, I don't know, you go back to the sporting analogy. You look at any successful sports team and you look at the coach, you look at the you know, the excitement level coming out of the locker room. People want to work in a culture where um, it's just more enjoyable to try to be, to have excellence. Yeah. And then, you know what? Clients give you that feedback, that love of, you know, thank you for thank doing you. it right. Yeah. And that's, I think that's what it is. And, um, you know, a lot of people are, are scared of that pressure, but I think if you can, like you said, welcome the chaos and it's, Chaos isn't a bad thing. It's like the chaos at Disneyland. If you can, if you can look at that and say, "Yeah, it's stressful. Yeah, it's chaos," but it's but you know what? You're not going to have as much chaos. Remember the word: be intuitive, have empathy, have sympathy, be a good listener. If you can shut up and listen to your clients, you will avoid circumstances that become uncomfortable because you will be ahead of them. No, you're also asking yourself, what could my client do or people to disrupt this opportunity, this listing, this buyer, this seller? Look down the road of the chessboard. If you feel a pee under the mattress, fix it. Always be ahead of your client. Always trying to be achieving that you're exceeding their expectations. Right, it's, it's like, that comes back to when you say you're gonna do something, you do it. You do it, and right? and, uh, and communicate, and pick up the phone. And um, it's all about relationships. The small things, the relationships, you know, I think, that's, I think that's what people need to understand is it's the small habits that compound into big habits, and then, you know, you are eventually where you wanna be, and if you aren't where you wanna be, then you just keep one, going one foot in front of the other until you're there. Yep. And you know, life should be joyful. Right. You know, so live in abundance. Uh, you know, when people ask me how I'm doing, even if I'm in a, having a bad day, I say life is abundant. And that immediately reminds me, you know, to be grateful. When I lived in the Caribbean, um, I actually did not have cable TV or any news for three years. All I did was listen to music. So my morning routine was I would get up and I had a cup of shells, 10 shells and I would make a cup of coffee, sit out in my back patio overlooking the ocean, aqua blue water, and I'd sit down the shells, take a drink of my coffee, and I'd take one shell out at a time, and I would think of something I was grateful for. It could be as simple as, I'm breathing. 
Right. Every day is a gift. That's why they and call it the present. If you start your day out that way and recognize that, you know, the difficult things are going to happen throughout the day, people are going to knock your plates over. But if you focus on the grateful side of things, I don't know, it's just a, you know, there's a special karma that comes back to you. Right. And um, there's a special calmness that comes back to you of just being okay with everything. And you know what? You're going to lose deals. You're going to lose clients. You're going to have some things go the wrong way. But as long as you know that you went the extra effort, you know, you probably, you know the 212 theory? Yep. You told okay. me that one. So yep. I, um, you know, everybody probably knows the 212 theory, but the bottom line is that the 212 theory, it's the one degree of difference. And... I shared this concept actually with the general manager of the Portland Trailblazers that was here for a short period, and he was saying, hey, 212 to the players. Basically, the 212 theory is to simplify it is that if you took a pot of water and you put it on a gas stove and you cranked up that gas stove and you're burning all that energy, you got those big flames, and you sit there and watch it for 10, 12 minutes, and you take it off, and it's at 211 degrees, it is hot, worthless water. But if you leave it on that stove for a little bit longer and you can get up to 212 degrees, it becomes boiling water. Boiling water creates steam. St steam can, can turn a turbine. A turbine can power a power plant and light up a city. Right. Because of one degree of difference. So, Evan, how many people do you think go to work and put in eight hours a day but leave... 10 minutes before 212. They work 211 degrees all day, every day. And they think, God, I'm, I'm putting in eight hours. I'm putting in nine hours. It's that one degree? It's that one degree of difference. And magic happens. You know, it's not a mystery how people succeed. I think if you really evaluate any successful self-made person, they go the 212. They go 213 degrees. They go, they go that extra one, degree. One, two, three, ten degrees extra and every it's day. Those, it's that that one degree that could be as simple as turning on the lights before the the owners come home. Yeah, and, 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 and one degree is not much. Well, like you know, for instance, I don't own a lockbox. I know there's all kinds of new technologies that <laughs> showing time and you don't own a lockbox. I don't own a lockbox. <laughs> so, so all of your houses, you can't. And then open them. You cannot see my houses unless you call me and let me know about your client and review the data on my house because I'm not going to waste my client's time, your time, my time showing you a house just for fun. Right. And so that and has you got to, a lot of fun houses. That has to be a qualified showing. Right. And once we've discussed that it's appropriate for your client to see the house, and I want your client to see the house, then all my showings are agent accompanied, which means I'm going to be at the showing. And when you get there, all the lights will be on, the doors will be open, the fireplaces will be lit. If I know you like country music or your client's from Texas, I'm playing, you know, country coffee shop when you walk in. Every element the sound, the fragrance, the lighting, I am going to it put on that Broadway show when you get there. You will never come into one of my houses dark, with the shades closed, without me. And that's that 212. And that's 212. And you know what, it's amazing because by being at the showings and having great content when I'm there, um, it does good magic for my business. I love it. And so that's the Terry Sprague, the 212. 212 and, degrees. You know, one foot in front of the other till you're there and chaos is a good thing. Yeah, just embrace life and, um, and live for joy. And you know, if you don't like what you're doing, go do something else. Right. And uh, you have time. You have lots of time. I mean, and you don't have to do one career, but don't wait for something better to come along. Ask yourself, if you're complaining about how, how life is going in your current career, then you know what? Fire yourself. Would you hire yourself? Right. I love it. Well, Terry, thank you for sharing the advice. And, and that's what it is. Call him if you have questions. You know, it's just kind of cool. We, we shot uh, 
a beautiful house here today. We took a moment on the beach, and um, what a fun little chat. It was great. Well, I appreciate you. I, I, you know, give this man a call if you have any questions. He'll answer and talk to you even if you're a nobody. Well, and you know, call, here's the cool thing too. You know, when, when clients call me uh, about their homes, I often say, look, whether you use me or not, I'll come out and give you the best advice that I can. Right. All right. And then, you know, our company is more like a law firm. We have some incredible brokers. So when I say, you know, we're talking about my business today, but my firm is made up of a group of incredible brokers that have expertise in different areas. So if I'm not the right guy, I have incredible brokers for every variety of real estate. Right. And so I want to be sure this is not about me. I could not do what I do. Number one, without the people that surround me. And then I have to tell you, my family is incredibly supportive. And uh, being a father of two teen teenagers right now, I find fascinating, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and so don't be afraid to make opportunities. Don't be afraid to find the person in charge and get in front of them and live your best life. That's right, 212. 212.